Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 10. Today we have Skylar J. Collins, uh, and he runs the everythingvoluntary.com website, and he's also got Everything Voluntary Facebook page, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the Nogler family incident in Kentucky. He's got some uh, interesting inside information that he's uh, willing to share with us. So, uh, Skylar, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Um, so why don't you start off with uh, telling us a little bit about how you became a voluntarist? Well, it started 10 years ago uh, when I first discovered the weekly columns of two economists by the names of Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell, two black economists. And what caught my attention was they were writing on uh, race issues as well as the economics. And so they were, they were talking about um, you know, minimum wage and how minimum wage hurts black teenagers the worst and, you know, things like that. And it, that kind of caught my attention. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, let's listen to what these guys have to talk about. They're black, so they're obviously not racist against other blacks. If it, if it was a white person writing on these, I might have dismissed it, not actually read it and considered what they were saying. Um, and so that's what introduced me to economics. And it was from there that I discovered the Foundation for Economic Education. Eventually, I discovered the Mises Institute and Austrian economics and libertarianism and then anarchism and then voluntarism. So that's kind of it. That's kind of everything in a nutshell. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Yeah, I, I follow yeah. those uh, those economists pretty closely as well. They're uh, pretty intelligent guys. Although I, I think I'm, I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Walter Williams is is not like necessarily an anarchist, right? Is that is that true? Jeremy? No, he he calls himself a libertarian. Yeah. Um, but no, he doesn't. He doesn't claim to. Neither neither does Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell is is more of a conservative as well. He's definitely a free market guy. He's more. He leans Chicago school slash Hayekian. He's yeah. not a Messiaen. Um, yeah. he's, he's definitely not an ANCAP. So. Yeah, yeah. So in the Chicago school is like, I think they 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 still claim the Federal Reserve is necessary, something like that, right? Yeah, they're monetarists. They they think something needs to be done. It's the Milton Friedman tradition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. All right. So um, so yeah. So so tell us a little bit about the Nogler family incident and you know what you've been um, learning about that. Well, it was, I think it when when this all got started, it was last Thursday. My my phone, my messenger app on my phone just started going wild with dings. You know, just ding 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 ding. ding. And I'm like, what the crap is going on? And I looked at it and. Um, my friend Pace Ellsworth, who has been directing the support effort, had created a chat group with 50 of us. And we we know Nicole through um, a Mormon anarchist group. I'm not currently a practicing Mormon. And a lot of people are. It's a really, you know, kind of Mormon and ex or post Mormon kind of mix. And it's it's pretty peaceful. You know, there's not like anti you know, fights or anything like that. But so I've known Nicole for probably a year now since she's been in that group, you know, and she posts all the time on different things, either, um, you know, Mormon related or parenting related or, um, you know, just kind of general run of the run of the mill stuff. And I've also seen a lot of the stuff she's put on regarding the way that her family lives, their lifestyle and the, the projects that they have going on and the things that they've built um, there on their little homestead. Anyway, so Pace, um, created this group chat with maybe 50 of us and said, Hey, um, Nicole's been arrested. The kids have been taken. And these are 10. She has 10 kids with one on the way. She's five, five months pregnant. And, and we're like, what well, you know, so I just kind of read through as much as I could, everything that was going on. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I think people are probably generally familiar with, with the situation right now. Nicole, um, was at her house with her two oldest sons and the reason that they were there alone was earlier in the week they had noticed some sheriff's cars at the edge of their property they own 23 acres that includes forests and a pond and then their makeshift cabin that they built themselves with with the help of their kids they have like an outdoor kitchen and they have you know other areas um, they've got what's called a compost toilet so they, they compost all of their waste and they have, you know, goats and chickens and dogs and cats, you know, so it's it's kind of a thing here. Um, and you can go to the, the Blessed Little Homesteading Facebook page and see, and you can even go to, I think it's blessedlittlehomesteading.blogspot.com or myblessedlittlehomestead.com. Um, I'll have to verify those for you and you can put them in your show notes. But 
you can see, I mean, she's, their lives have been very transparent. Every week she's putting up pictures of the projects they're working on and the adventures that their the kids are having. And, and like I said, there's, there's 10 kids. And so all of them are doing different things and they're all basically learning um, to, you know, learning these valuable skills of building from the ground up a homestead. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing to see. I mean, are they running around in bare feet in dirt and I guess, animal feces here and there well yeah they they live with animals so of course they're going to step in that stuff <laughs> i mean you know that's that's some of the criticisms they've been receiving is oh these kids sleep in feces all day of course they should be taken away you know blah 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 anyway wow. um but yeah i mean it's it's like a it's like a you know a, a year-long camping trip basically and and like i said anyways they're, they they built a cabin um anyway so the, the situation was earlier in the week I think Monday or Tuesday, they noticed some sheriffs at the end of their property. So they were like, what's going on here? And they had been harassed before early, you know, they, they've had this property for 18 months. They've been in this area for 18 months. Prior to that, they were kind of moving around a bit for a year. And prior to that, they had a house. And again, this is all transparent and documented on their blogs and stuff. And there's there's pictures every week and so on and so forth. Um, Anyway, so they had they had developed a plan that if you know these guys show up again, you know everybody go to the edge of the the other edge of the property and just wait for mom and dad to make sure everything's okay, you know, because they they they're where they're well aware that they are not mainstream. Okay, this is an intentional homesteading project. It's an intentional unschooling family, peaceful parenting, radical unschooling. Their kids are not in school, and they've attracted some attention from from neighbors, you know, who who see that there's these 10 kids and they're not in school all day long running around in, you know, without shoes on and what whatever. And it's attracted some unwanted attention. And so they've had, you know, sheriffs kind of visit them before and, and child protective services visit them before. Anyway, so they had this plan to go to the other edge of the property and then mom and dad would figure it out. So that that's what happened. Um, but then after that first incident, they decided, okay, let's go stay at a friend's for a couple of days. And so the entire family did that. Um, Nicole and the two oldest went back to the house, um, I think just to get some stuff. And that's when these sheriffs showed up and Nicole has released the audio. She immediately started recording like a good libertarian would. Um, the entire incident, you can listen all about it. And the guy's there and he doesn't have any warrants. And she keeps telling him, no, you can't search my property. No, you can't talk to my kids. Come back with a warrant, come back with our lawyers. And they just push the issue. They end up getting into their cabin and looking around. And, you know, and the guy's like, well, we, we received a tip and, and you know, your neighbor's saying that, and, and, the, and the cop sounds like, you know, he's kind of like, well, I, I really don't believe it, but this was the complaint, you know? So he's, he's being very diplomatic and he's being very friendly with them. And you can, you can tell all this again on the audio, it's all available there on the saveourfamily.info website. Um, anyway, and she continues to deny him, you know, she doesn't want to cooperate with them and she doesn't, she doesn't have to, she's not obligated to cooperate with them, you know? So she, uh, eventually towards the end, she's like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to get in my car and drive off, but you're probably going to find some excuse to pull me over. And the, and the sheriff say, no, we don't do stuff like that. So she gets in her car, 20 seconds later, they pull her over. Wow. <laughs> One of the sheriffs is on the phone with a judge saying, Hey, we want to take the kids. You know, she's not being cooperative. You know, we, we saw where they live and it's, you know, not, it's not on the up and up according to our standards, our mainstream standards. And so we want to, we want to take the kids and the judge gave them the okay. And that's when on the audio, Nicole just loses it. You can't take my son and she's freaking out yelling at him because you know, she's a mama bear and you're stealing her cubs, you know? So that's when she loses it and they end up arresting her. And again, she's five months pregnant, but she's, she's, um, she's got bruises on her arms from it. And she was forced under the hood of the car, put in handcuffs. Oh. And again, this is all recorded. Uh -huh. And they charge her with disorderly and resisting arrest because, you know, they think we have an obligation to participate. in. How can you be disorderly kidnapping. on your own property? <laughs> exactly. Well, and I don't know if they were still on their property. They were driving away. They may have been off their property. Anyway. Uh, they shouldn't have uh, left. They should have waited for the sheriff to leave. <laughs> oh, right. Just, yeah, instead of just getting the cart. Yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway, so then Joe pulled up with a friend and his audio was also available on the website. And, you know, at first the sheriff's wanting to impound the car, but he's like, no, I'm here. You can't impound it, you know, because that's just an unnecessary fee. You know, why, why would you take my car? And so, you know, he, he orders Joe to get back in the car. So Joe gets back in the car and the friend is like, hey, can I can I be the mediator here and, and you know, talk? And Joe is handling it very well. And so the friend 
negotiates and lets them take the car and so they don't impound it and and the sheriff basically says bring the rest of your kids to the station tomorrow by 10 a.m. or I'm going to arrest you for a felony you know it's just it's just really kind of like just the way it goes down just has that that taste of um, what's the word I'm looking for um, lack of due process well lack of due process but also like spite like he's just like he's just so pissed that he's just like bring the rest of your kids and blah 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 anyway so you know they comply with that the next day but it was that night Joe after taking the car back home got on the phone and sent the message to Pace saying Nicole's been arrested the kids two of the kids have been taken the rest they want to take and that's when Pace created the chat group and invited 40 of us in so I kind of followed it initially and it's been ongoing ever since. The, the chat itself is over 5,000 messages, you know, a week later. Probably more by now. So what, what happened with the court uh, Monday? I, I, I've been keeping up with it, but I haven't been intently paying attention. Um, so Monday, if I remember, they had their inspection with Child Protective Services. The kids right now are in four different houses in four different counties. Monday they had the inspection, and according to them... They passed the inspection and the CPS passed it and they're not requiring that they change anything. But the judge, because they have hearings for their arrests and OK, so Joe was also charged with a, a, a misdemeanor menacing. OK, because he was the complaint was that the complaint was that he was trying to get water from the neighbor. And according to the Nogglers, they had agreements with their neighbor to get to get water out of their well. And so he went there to try to get water. But I guess earlier he had unfriended her on Facebook. And so she was like, no, you can't have water. You know, there's enmity between us now, whatever, please leave. And according to them, that's, that's what happened. They left without any water and without any threats. But the complaint lists that he threatened them and he, and he, and he even told his son, go get my gun, you know, just, just this weird thing. Um, and that he stole the water. Anyway, so it's he said, she said. So he was charged with menacing, and then she has her disorderly conduct and her resisting arrest. So what I believe has happened is the judge has not allowed the kids to be returned, even though they passed the CPS inspection. And right now, and people have asked and demanded that they release some sort of proof that the CPS inspection passed, but they can't because it's kind of locked up in these ongoing cases. So anyways, the judge is not letting the kids be released until these other matters are resolved they're not felonies so yeah they're not even felonies they should they're misdemeanors so even if they did get even if they did get found guilty of them which they're probably not because of how the disorderly and out of the law the, the officers acted um they wouldn't even go to jail for them so they're probably just going to get a fine which they're just going to start a kickstarter or a gofundme and everyone's going to pay it yeah, so initially um, that next day, Pace did set up a GoFundMe, and you know I spread the link around, and everybody involved spread the link around. It was picked up by Off the Grid News. Eventually, it was picked up by Police State Daily, and after that, throughout the last week, it's been picked up all over the place. Um, you know, all of these, you know, not any mainstream news sites, but all of these independent ones. Um, but that GoFundMe page did reach forty-seven thousand within seven days and then they they did turn it off and they've changed their help button to a it goes to a page where you can um, use paypal now at this point or or even bitcoin i think they have a widget or they're going to put a widget up, widget up there because a lot of people have said oh well i want to donate bitcoin um you know so i think they should sue the state <laughs> well yeah they're they're the state um the state thinks it had a wild card because Joe actually has another son that's 19 years old that he lost when the kid was four or five. Um, I think Joe was like myself when I was a new father until my son was five. I, I would yell at him and I would spank him and I would get pretty ugly. I think Joe may have been the same way. So the kid was visiting some family in New Hampshire and this is when I believe they lived in Texas and the kid was visiting some family in New Hampshire, and I guess my my guess is that the kid may have said something about my dad spanking me, and they immediately went to Child Protective Services for an emergency hearing, and but then they only gave the Joe and Nicole three hours to get there, you know, and they just they didn't have money and they didn't have time to get from Texas in that you know to New Hampshire in that time, and so 
by default on that technicality, they lost, they lost, he lost his son. Um, and so, you know, this, the state now during that hearing on Monday, the, the state had flown him in and he's 19 now. And I guess his testimony was that he was physically abused and that he was sexually abused. But along the course of being questioned by the defense attorney, the Nogler's attorney, at some point, it, he basically had even the prosecutor shaking his head like, I can't believe I, I have this witness up here. This guy's obviously not very credible. So what I think's happened, and um, Nicole actually wrote about this, what she calls the story of Alex. The kid's name is Alex. And the situation, she wrote about it in 2013 on her blog, um, kind of that whole situation and how how they lost him because they, they, they weren't given the opportunity to fight for him. Um, and that he, um, absolutely was never sexually abused. And the most Joe ever did was, was spank him. Um, and I just, you know, I'm picturing myself in that, um, personally. So the state thought they had a wild card and a lot of people have, you know, taken that and condemned the Nogglers thinking that, and, and the kid himself, he, he had, a, I guess he had a press conference after the hearing with the sheriff. And he said that I'm only concerned about the other kids and I want to get them out of that, that home because they're being abused too. And blah, 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 blah. I mean, if you look at the history of the Nogglers and you look at, you know, again, their transparency. And again, they put up pictures every week on, on the things that they do. The kids are obviously happy. They're obviously healthy and they're obviously safe. So what this has really become, and this is something I wrote this week, is it's become a battle of ideologies, right? There are people who, you know, ideologically, they're against primitivism and off the grid and homesteading and that sort of thing, which there are elements of that here. Um, and they think, you know, the kids should be in a house and they shouldn't be running around in the dirt all day. Um, but there's other um, ideology, ideological battles here too, right? There's, there's individualism versus collectivism, you know, the state has statism versus anarchism, the state has a right to come in and take your kids. There's just all these different battles kind of being waged right now. And the Nogglers have found a ton of support, absolutely a lot of support, but they've also found a lot of the opposite. It's really been kind of a dividing controversial issue for them. And it's because of the way that they choose intentionally to live close to nature as possible. So there are those primitivist elements um, and again, they're anarchists. They're also homeschoolers, and so the kids aren't in school, and so that that's that's another battleground. Um, but you know, they're fighting through it now. Nicole, last week, she actually was supposed to open on her new business. She has been a dog groomer for 20 years, and she has an amazing clientele, and her clients absolutely love her. And so she finally decided to start her own business, and that's something that her and Pace have been working on since December. Pace Ellsworth started a cryptocurrency crowdsourcing company called Kapistan. Sounds familiar. It's based on and Kapistan, right? And she is the first client of that. And I think they raised like $20,000 through that. And so she's, you know, in the middle of opening this business when, when this happens. And so that's kind of what they spent this week doing is, is doing a lot of uh, uh, furniture shopping and that kind of stuff. And that's just invited more criticism because people say, well, why aren't you fighting to get your kids back? What are you worrying about your business for? And it's like, you guys are idiots. For starters, there's nothing they can do. Things are scheduled and they can't get their kids back. Okay, they can't just go get them. And this is their livelihood. They have to do what they can do. They have to continue moving forward in every area. And so that's, you know, that's, those are criticisms that are just, you know, ignorant as a lot of them have been. But anyway, so that's, that's kind of the entire incident in a nutshell. So hopefully... Um, you know, the money that they've got will definitely accelerate their projects. They, they had already had plans to build a bigger cabin by September before all of this started. They have a rain collection um, project that they started. Um, I understand they've, they've been given some solar equipment has been donated to them for this to help them out in that in that area with electricity. And so this money will help accelerate a lot of their projects. But you know, again, they're, they're still not going to build like a modern house and this and that. They want to live the way that they've been living. It's a, it's a chosen intentional lifestyle. So yeah, there it is. Wow. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, you, you touched on, you know, with the estranged son, cause that was the one part of the story that I saw, but I, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to follow up on. And, you know, based on what you said, I mean, even if, if even the defense, you know, if even the prosecutor was shaking his head, then it does seem like that might there might be some spite involved there too. I mean, if, if something did happen to him, I mean, that's horrible, obviously. But 
if he hasn't been around them since he was five, is that basically what you're you're saying with that? If he was taken away from them when he was like five or something like that, like, and he's nineteen That's now. Yeah. How? You yeah, know, he was I mean, four or five, and he was he was taken by Joe's uncle, and um, according to Joe and Nicole, and this again is according to them, they understand that that uncle was was pretty harsh with them, and Nicole um, will also tell you that she has a cousin that has told her that that uncle would grope her and, and be abusive towards her. Mm. And so what I think has happened is this uncle probably talked a lot of smack about Joe, probably convinced this kid that he was being abused. And if he was being spanked, he probably used that to convince him that he was being sexually abused, right? You spank on the butt, that's a sexual organ. You're being sexually abused, right? So this kid was probably told this early on. And then who knows what happened, you know, abuse wise going forward. And now if you look at the kid's Facebook page today, I feel really bad and I have a lot of sympathy for this kid because he is really messed up. I mean, he is just talking all sorts of craziness. Okay. And you can, if, I don't know, you want me to tell you his name is, is he's already kind of public out of there because he's, he's testified. Um, I'll give you the link and you can put it in the show notes if you want, but I, I don't, you know, I wouldn't. No, we're, we're not going to brigade or anything like that. No. Sure. Sure. I mean, what, what I like, I like I said though. I mean, unfortunately, when it comes to that aspect of the story, it, it's still kind of, I guess, he said, she said stuff. Sure. You know, you don't know, but ev everything else. I mean, unfortunately, we've talked about it on our show numerous times already. This is just, this is the state in action. You know, mm -hmm. like like everything you said. The you know, it was it was a nosy neighbor who complained, and somebody who thinks they're doing right will just run to the state and this is what happens you know i mean like like you said they they're so transparent about their lifestyle it's not like they're trying you know if they're if they're hiding something they're really good <laughs> um but the, you know it's it's sad that, that they have to go through this just because they they want to live their life a certain way and they want to raise their kids that way you know i mean i i support I, I support them in general for what they were trying to do in the first place. I mean, that's something I've, ever since I came to volunteerism, that that's kind of something I've dreamed of doing with my with my family too, like moving off, you know, maybe not necessarily off the grid right away, but I, I'd love to to be involved in something like that too. And it's it's a shame that so many people just, as you said, you know, they, it's it's outside the mainstream, so they think it must be bad, and they will stick their nose in because, well, I didn't raise my kids like that, and nobody should raise their kids like that. And the funny thing, you said a couple of times about, you know, the complaints, well, they're, 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 they're in the dirt all the time. Well, what's wrong with that? They're kids. Like, most people baby the heck out of their kids and are always cleaning them up and using the, you know, the antibacterial soap and the antibacterial, um, you know, hand, hand wipes and all that stuff. And it's like, you wonder why your kids are sick all the time? Because you're not letting them get out and play in the dirt. And, and here's this family who's letting them live that life, you know, and, and as you said, all, you know, all outward appearances are that the kids are happy with this and, and they're having fun. And it's just because somebody else is unhappy with that decision that their whole life can be turned upside down and and that's you know for for people like us that's a scary proposition because you know anybody who wants to do um even just the homeschooling unschooling you know we did we talked about that in last week's episode mm -hmm. uh, you know even if you just want to do that even if you don't want to go the homesteading route um you know depending on what state you're in you can face a lot of not just criticism, but you face that constant threat of, you know, the CPS or, or whatever, whatever the, the ridiculous agency is called in your particular state, you know, cracking down on you and breathing down your neck. And, and, and if you're not doing things the way they approve of, then they're going to send a SWAT team to your door. You know, I mean, Dave, you'd said earlier that, um, you know, why she left the property. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I don't think that was one of those things, at least as, as far as I've read into it, it's not one of those things she could have really waited out because they were obviously stalking the place for days beforehand, you know, and, and staking the whole area out. So somebody was going to be sitting on that property, <laughs> um, whether she left right then or we, whether she waited two hours or four hours or 10 hours. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm sure she was just trying to get the family back together because, you know, Skylar, as you said, it was it was probably just a, a last run to pick up some last minute you know, items. And uh, you just want to get the whole family back together. That's why they all left. And, and now they have to deal with this. It's, you know, there's, there's so many people out there that would see this. And, and like you said, that the ignorant comments and the ignorant thoughts. And it's just, well, it's 
they're doing things that they shouldn't be, so of course they should be punished. It's like, no, the, the kids are getting punished, you know? I mean, how many times do you see stories? Well, you won't see it in the mainstream news, but if, if you read the alternative news like we do, um, you know, how many times kids get taken away from their parents and put into these, you know, even if it's a temporary foster care situation, um, you know, and they end up getting beaten, raped, killed by the foster parents because these people aren't, you know, not, they're not vetted very heavily. You know, a lot of states have places, you know, have, have populations that, that want to be foster parents just for the money they get for it. And, uh, you know, these, you know, there's been stories before of kids getting taken away because the, you know, the parent, they found pot on the, you know, on the parent. And it's like, okay, he wasn't hurting anybody. They weren't doing it around the kids. What's the problem? Oh, no, we need to take him away. And then the poor child gets beaten in the foster care home. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really boils down to just, people unfortunately meddling in other people's business when they don't really know what's going on and and just because it looks weird to them they they think their first instinct is oh, i gotta call somebody something must be done it's it's that whole you know there ought to be a law crowd it's uh mm -hmm. they they are they are actually I, I consider those people a bigger danger to me on an everyday basis than the actual agents of the state it's those people that have nothing better to do with their lives than try to bend everybody else to their will you know i think they are actually the greatest danger to people like ourselves cowards yeah. well my my point on this whole situation is uh a very easy one you don't see the government doing this to the mennonites you don't see the governments doing this to the the amish or the quakers or etc cetera, etc cetera. you know you know let's get out move out here and block or isolate ourselves out from the rest of the world which they're not doing um i mean that's why i think uh, more and more that volunteerism should be a state recognized religion <laughs> <laughs> to get those protections i, I understand I, I, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone should file for that <laughs> i just wanted to say probably the the main thing that should be concerning for everybody whether you're a libertarian or not is that when the, when the when the sheriffs got there and they asked and they didn't have a warrant they didn't have probable cause and they just asked if they could talk to the kids and if they could search the place and they were told no it was at that point that they should have left because they did not leave right but for them staying that was the point of escalation and so you know whatever everything that happened after that was but for that cause of them not leaving and going and getting a warrant or going and filing something with CPS and then letting CPS come out and do an inspection. Because I understand that the initial CPS inspection does not involve sheriffs. They just come out and knock on your door and say, hey, we got this complaint. It's only when, um, you know, when it escalates from there that they'll come back with sheriffs if they need to. But this was just the sheriffs. This wasn't even with the CPS. And they didn't have a warrant. They didn't have probable cause. And and I think that's something that everybody should be concerned with when they, when they don't, when they aren't even following their own rules, which you know, as par for the course, we understand that as libertarians and as anarchists, but everybody else needs to needs to see that. And that's why I think the audio, you know, was such a good thing to release. I mean, the audio is always a good thing to release. It's done nothing, nothing but got them more support. So I was just going to say that, um, you know, Jeremy, you, you brought up a good point about the uh, the snitches. And and I think that that kind of reminds me of the um, the recent George Reisman article on, um, you know, Nazi uh, you know, National Socialist Party, where you're saying that was a very big um, part of that is, is uh, you know, it, it's not only people afraid of the state and what the state can do to them, but people being fearful of their own neighbor for snitching on them. So, so it's like people, you know, they can make a law about like, um, you know, um, you know, regulating particular products, and then people would choose to 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 interact in the in the black market. But then, if you're afraid of snitches, then you're even afraid to in interact in the black market, right? Because that person could be a government agent or a snitch, right? And and so it's it's um. Well, they made that law, and in, in, uh, 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 Lenin made that law in Russia. If you saw your neighbor hoarding food more than what they needed if you didn't report them you would get a more severe punishment than the person's mm -hmm. hoarding food mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 1984 yeah i was just saying that the um you know the, the the state really relies on people to intimidate you know their neighbor right that's that's another you know we were talking about fear being a major 
tenet of statism. It's it's fear of your neighbor, fear of what your neighbor might do, or you know, fear that people are are the monsters that the that the government schools try to make them out to be. And so we should put our faith in government, in Uncle Sam, right? That he's going to take care of us and protect us from our neighbor. <laughs> but when, when in fact, when we do that, when we empower the state, we become the monsters that we fear other people will become, <laughs> All right? And, and, and CPS is, uh, you know, it's uh, basically legal kidnapping, right? It's um, like you said, Jeremy, you know, there are much worse... Um, <clears throat> much worse results occur when kids are you know detached from their own from their own family and in most cases yeah in most yeah the majority of the cases vast majority of the cases um you know they're in a much worse off situation you know you know um they're medicated like beyond belief since, since cps has a has an in, has an um, incentive to um in order to receive more funds they have, you know they they, they find they they diagnose more psychiatric disorders with the children, and then they get you know more funding for the medication. And the kids are drugged up, they're abused, they're beaten, they're, you know all this kind of stuff. And you know so many times more likely to be abused and killed and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's really tragic how people they they like you said, Jeremy. They 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 call CPS out of the goodness of their hearts, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. You know, it's so sad. They well, just I mean, don't, no one. You know, they don't no understand the, dis- the monster they're unleashing. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no one's discounting like. Or no one's saying that there aren't some cases where CPS saves a kid's life. Like, that happens. All right? That's that's not the point anyone's making when they're making an anti-CPS. A, 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 clock, is, a clock is right twice a day. Right? Well, yeah, I'm not – that's not justification for oh, it sorry, to a broken exist. clock. A broken – well, <laughs> well, no, but, no but, yeah, of, of course. There, there, there's good and bad out of most government agencies, you know, certain times good things will happen but that's not the point the point is it's the only game in town so you can't just sweep the bad stuff under the rug and you know even if it's you know half good and bad it's it's still it's you know i i think i've said this before it it drives me nuts because a lot of the people that will make the argument to say that oh we need programs like this because we have to protect the children are the same ones that are you know a lot of them are anti-gunners and they use the, you know, if it saves just one child rhetoric. Well, where is that thinking in this? If it saves just one child? Well, you know, kids die. Even if just one child dies through CPS, why are you not using the same argument? <laughs> you know, and, and then De- Danilo, you were touching on, you know, what I had said about the snitches and stuff. And yeah, that's, that's the horizontal enforcement. That is actually where the state gains a lot of its power. I mean, we've talked about it before. It starts with the belief in authority. But once you have that belief in your head, once you believe the state is necessary and that certain people are allowed to be in a position of authority over you, well, it makes it that much easier for you to participate in the system because the state, no matter what state it is, no matter what time in history it is, they are always severely outnumbered by the by the citizenry. So what's to stop the citizenry from turning around on them one day and saying, well, we don't want this anymore. Well, that's where the horizontal enforcement comes in, because when you have the majority of people that believe in this system and believe that it's legitimate, they'll turn people in for, you know, for anything just because, oh, somebody's breaking the law. I have to say something. You know, you, you talked about, you know, Dave, you talked about how Lenin did that stuff. It's even the same here. The whole see something, say something thing campaign that started after 9-11. You know, that's basically what it is. Like, yes, do you want to protect people from bad things happen to them? If if you're a good moral person, yes. But to run to the state just because they say if you see something, say something, it's, you know, it, it turns into so much worse than that because people just start, people are in a, in a panic and they're afraid. So they'll just report anybody for anything that seems out of the ordinary. And when it comes to people like us, that a lot of the aspects of our lives seem out of the ordinary to the average citizen, we're a constant target. You know, it, you know, Skylar, you had said about, you know, I guess kind of the mistakes that were made and, and led to the escalation. You know, that's the unfortunate thing, though, because somebody like the, the, the Nogler family who knew their rights and, you know, and, and you said, Nicole, you know, specifically said, you're not allowed here. I'm not, you know. Most people don't even know that. Most people see a cop come to their property and they'll just go, okay, if a cop says, 
can I come in and have a look around? Well, they're holding a gun and they got this shiny badge. Must mean they know something. So, okay, sure. You like most people won't even hesitate. And the people like us that will put up a fight, where are you, you know, we are actually standing up for the purported purposes of the, the, you know, the constitutional system and how we're supposed to have rights that are protected. Like we say things that should get us technically out of trouble with the cops, but they, most, most, most law enforcement hates people <laughs> that exert their rights. I mean, I had to deal with this recently where I, where I had a run in with the cops and I was very, you know, I, I've actually had two in the past year and the, the first time it, it didn't go so well because I exerted my rights and the, and the cop took umbrage with that and uh, ended up slapping some cuffs on me just because I refused to give him my license. Um, you know, the next time around, I got lucky because I got some cops that apparently had dealt with issues like that before. And they actually called the sergeant in to make sure my rights weren't violated, you know, but the average person, they, they don't realize that they just they see that authority figure and they will bow down. And and those are the people that end up getting their kids taken away a lot because they, they don't know. They, they think, you know, they'll, they'll think, oh, I if I if if I haven't done anything wrong, I'll be OK. And I'll just, you know, they'll let the kids, you know, they'll, they'll let the kids go off with the cops, assuming that, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. I'll get them back. But once you let them in, you know, they'll a lot of times they'll just they'll find things. They'll 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 it's make like a up, vampire. Yeah, they'll, they'll <laughs> make up stuff. That, yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll find the they'll find the littlest thing to trump up a charge, because as you touched on, Danilo, unfortunately, you know, the, the CPS and, and agencies like that they're they're a part of the government so of course their their funding originally comes from an extorted place but there is that connection with like the pharmaceutical companies like you were talking about and how they drug these kids up so all these people have a vested interest in making sure you know just like the prison system has a vested interest in making sure they stay filled cps and, and these agencies have a vested interest in getting their hands on as many kids as possible all in the name of you know good so that they can continue to line their own pockets and it's 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 quite sickening and and too many people just don't want to look at that aspect and they will just keep keep the blinders on and say oh um we're, we're protecting the children they protect the children and it's it's so so many times it's the exact opposite i i just um one of the issue and i i i kind of like to see something say something because i think we can turn that around on you know the agents of the state themselves if you see them doing something pull out your phone and record it and then say something you know yeah. um but i think you know and i and i and i also don't mind when when neighbors are being a little nosy and they think something might be wrong you know because if somebody was at my house or somebody who i thought was a friend with was, was with my kids and he was maybe being inappropriate i would want a neighbor to call or to call me or to, to report that to somebody but the problem I think comes when, when there is a call and thing, you know, and they get involved and things escalate and they take the kids, and then later it's determined, hopefully by an impartial judge, which you know we don't have right now, that the, it, it's seen as not being an issue. Those people who took your kids should be liable for that, and right now they're not. They have what I'm sure you're familiar with called, and police officers have this too, called qualified immunity. So you can't turn around and go after them for, you know, acting, you know, for, for pulling the trigger a little too early, you know, because they're, they're not responsible for that. And so that disincentivizes um, their behavior, right? Or because or, the incentive to be a little bit more careful is, is taken away because now they're not liable for their mistakes. In fact, I mean, how many federal agencies, when they, when they make mistakes and they fail, it's an excuse for more funding, you know? That's kind of a, a common argument. Uh, if we would have only had more money. <laughs> <laughs> right. We could have investigated a little bit better. Yeah. And so, you know, the incentives, again, are, are, are the other way. Um, I did want to say this. I think that the Nogglers, they've, they've got some funds now to, uh, like I said, um, speed up some of the projects that they had planned, um, improve their area a little bit, and that'll be good. And people will like to see that. But their kids are suffering right now, right? You've got everyone from, um, a, I think the youngest is two, two and a half, you know, to the oldest who's, who's 15 or 16 maybe. And those little ones, they don't have mom and dad right now. 
and they're suffering for that. And so I think this needs to be a lesson to the Nagars to say, look, I, I think as, as individuals, we should stick to our principles and we should stick, you know, we should, we should do what we can. I think civil disobedience in that regard is good. And I think standing for your principles is good, but there's a point where your actions cause suffering for somebody else, somebody who's innocent. And these kids are innocent in that and you're causing suffering for them. So I think the lesson for them is to improve your property um, and continue the transparency with your improvements. Let the world know that, you know, your kids are safe and they are healthy. And I think they've done a really good job of showing that, but make the improvements that, you know, I, I hate to say it, but maybe you should move a little bit towards mainstream. I think it's a self-defensive move, not only for yourselves, but more importantly for your kids, because you don't want your kids to have to suffer through this again. So, I, you know, I think civil disobedience is a virtue when it involves yourself, but when that inflicts suffering and harm on innocent third parties, that's when I kind of start to pull back a little bit. What do you guys think about that? Well, I, I would push back a little bit that only from my own personal perspective. I, I actually recently did a little rant on this um, for my little my little side project that I do, um, because it, it's a tough spot for for somebody who actually is principled. I mean, I, I, I think you're you're right to an extent that, you know, it, it would it make it easier and, and are, you know, are the children getting unfairly punished? Absolutely. You know, for me, though, it, it comes down to not only being principled for myself, but like with my children, you know, I have two young girls at, at home and I've been, you know, most of their life already, their lives already, I've been trying to teach them this stuff and I've been trying to, you know, introduce these, the, the, the ideas and, and the principles that I believe in, um, you know, hoping that they'll, they'll understand it and, and accept it as well. I'm not forcing it upon them, but I'm, you know, trying to you know, butter them up a little bit and hopefully they see it. But when it comes down to situations like this, yes, you want, you want to be with them, obviously, and you don't want them taken away. But for me, I, I have a hard time looking at that and saying, okay, well, if I do, you know, if I play ball a little bit and I, you know, I, as you said, you know, go a little more mainstream. So there's not as much trouble for, I have a hard time being able to look them in the eye after that and still try to teach them these things. You know, I mean, sure, I could teach them, okay, daddy had to play ball just so we could get this because this is the situation we live in now. But if I'm trying to be principled and trying to teach them about principle, like, how do I look them in the eye after that? You know, like I said, I, every, if what you're saying makes sense. But for me, I, I, I struggle with that because I want to be able, I, I try to be as open and honest with my kids as possible. And it's hard for me to get over that by saying, well, you know, I just had to compromise this one time because that's the same argument I use against politicians when people say to me, oh, this guy's a good guy and, you know, he'll do things for us. I'm like, no, because you can see right now he's already compromised his principles once to play the game, you know, so I, I put that same lens on me and I'm like, well, are you going to compromise to get to make things easier in the short term? Um, you know, how, how much is that going to set them back? How much am I going to have to now reteach them later on? You know, I, that, that, these are just the things that I think about I think, when it comes to that. I think the whole gun to the head argument could be made against yours, Jeremy. But, I mean, at what point, like, how far do you take, you know, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees, you know? It, 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 where's the line? Do you, what, what line do you draw at that point? You know, like, because I pay taxes and I can't honestly say, I mean, because there's a gun to my head. I pay taxes or I don't work and lose everything and then become a welfare parasite or live in the woods. I mean, <laughs> what, what do I do here? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm there, well, my hands are tied behind my back. It's, it's a question of your values. You know, I mean, what do you value more than anything other? And some people, they value their principles more than their own lives. Um, for some people, they value their principles more than their lives and the lives of their loved ones. I wrote an essay once on pacifism, and I wrote that. I think, I think pacifism is great, and it's definitely a voluntarist um, compatible philosophy. But I draw the line at strict pacifism. I think if you're laying down your life, and you laying down your life has the result of your loved ones getting killed. To me, that's, that's, that's not honorable at all. 
you know, because again, it's introducing that suffering. Now to go to Jeremy's point, you, you want to be that example to your kids of somebody who stands by their principles. And I think the older kids, the older Nogler kids will see that. And I, I hope that's the lesson they take and that will make them stronger, you know, as they get older and they, they enter that adult world. Um, the younger kids, of course, they, they won't understand that at all. They just know that their mommy and their daddy's not there. And so, you know, maybe later on that, you know, that can be explained. And I think if they build a good relationship with their kids, one based, but one based on love and respect and closeness, which I, I believe they are, um, then later on, you know, that relationship will be repaired. You know, the, the temporary setback with being separated, that, that, that really hurts a relationship. That can be repaired, and then as kids get older, they can kind of come to, to understand things. Unless it becomes a perpetual thing, you know. Okay. Then what will happen is they'll start to resent mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad, you, you could have prevented this, but you didn't. You must not love us very much because you let us, you let them keep taking us. You know, and that, that can be very damaging I mean, too. So I, there is definitely a fine line there. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the more kids you have. They got 10 kids. I know? mean, I'd honestly rather be dead in a ditch somewhere than have 10 kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm literally, I'm not like, like you guys are laughing, but I, I Dave's honestly. Sensitivity. No, Dave, we know, we know you're serious. That's why, that's why we're laughing. It's literally dead serious. Like if I, if my girlfriend got pregnant and they said quintuplets or, or. <laughs> Yeah. quadruplets or whatever oh, i would it would be a where's hard, my where's my gun where's my gun it would be hard not to either fake my own death and move to costa rica uh, oh god i don't know it just scares the shit out of me i can't well, imagine having a know, kid right now and i'm almost 30 so. well and that's and that's that's because we're all living in an unnatural human human beings evolved in in tribes and and they evolved in extended family um households you know so having a baby was not a terrible burden because there were so many people to share that burden with but now the single family household is just such an natural thing that, that kids don't have their needs met and mom and dad don't have their needs met when they do have a lot of kids like this so right now uh, nicole is doing her business and pet grooming joe my hell, Joe is an impressive guy. He's at home teaching the kids, you know, to, to build the homestead and all the different projects. And he's also the primary unschooler, you know, with all the kids from the little kids to the older kids and the older kids, of course, help out. And they're, they're learning to become great fathers themselves. I think they have like two or three girls out of all of them. So they're mostly boys. So when these kids are all adults, I mean that, you know, just watch out because they're going to be peaceful parents they are going to be unschoolers. And they're going to they're going to know they're going to have these skills to survive the zombie apocalypse, for hell's sake. <laughs> I mean, I would honestly pick the life that those kids are, are currently having over what I experienced as a, as a child. You know, I it I grew up, kind of, you know, I'm an Alabama boy. I grew up in the woods, running out in the woods all day. You know, it wasn't this sit in the house and play Game Boy all day. It was mom would lock us out of the house and say go play in the woods and when you get back we'll do a tick check so it was it was Your mom would be arrested right now for that yeah well it, you, you guys know would be taken away you know i not not in alabama <laughs> so, maybe, maybe downtown birmingham where you know there's really no reason why like somebody should be running around downtown but uh not where i grew up man i grew up out in the woods I, uh, I I can sympathize a lot with Jeremy because him and I are in a similar position with the young kids. Um, and I, I often have this uh, this argument with my wife, too. Like, um, you know, <laughs> you know, ever since I've known her, she's always known me to be contrarian and, you know, always to be difficult. you got to be That's difficult. That's what I get called. You just, just got to be different. Why don't you just, like, fit in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I read, I I learn about new things, and I like to express them. You know, and and uh, and my wife is a type of person. She's like, I just want to fit in, and I don't want people to look at us and think we're weird. <laughs> Danilo, are you oftenly referenced as the guy who ruins everything? Because that that's yeah, right. me. I get that a lot. Yeah, somebody will be talking and be like, actually, that's all bullshit. People, and it, here's people, the truth. <laughs> people like when I have some family reunions, people say, all right, you know, how you doing? And don't talk about government. Don't talk about anarchy. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but but um but yeah, it's it's a difficult thing to uh, you know to to make a decision about because like you know like Jeremy said, you don't want to be made look as a hypocrite, right, to your kids. You wanna you wanna have moral consistency, right, because that strengthens the the position of that you are, that you are espousing, right, the morality that you're showing them that you're trying to live by example, right, and and I think that's that's the um, that's the big advantage that that volunteers have is that we can live by example like like statists they don't live by example right there's there's all these double standards and all these hypocrisies happen but they just accept it right <laughs> but we actually live consistently we try to live consistently and we try to set examples for our kids and and that's what I'm trying to do and um, you know it's it's a it's a frightening prospect to think about like they're in, in, their, in their situation I'm not I'm not really sure what I would do in that situation you know um, because I would. I, I don't know. Oh, you're up. <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's really hard to say because I I think I would stand my ground and I would defend my kids and um, I I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't allow the state to take them away. But but then again, I'm just one guy, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, I think it's so important that we live by example and we show our kids not only by words but by actions, right? And, 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 you know, if, if, if you really wanted to fit in with society, we would be putting them in, in government schools. You know, if we really wanted to fit in and make friends and, you know, you know have pleasant conversation at dinner parties, <laughs> you know, we would be doing all that stuff. But we don't. So, obviously, we don't want to fit in. We don't care about fitting in. We don't care about having those kinds of friends, you know. And, um, and that's fine with me, you know, as, as long as I'm morally consistent. So. That's my big thing. You know, Danilo, the other day, my girlfriend looked at me and goes, you, 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 I find it so odd that you just have the weirdest ability to not give a flying fuck what anybody <laughs> thinks about you. And I said, babe, when you don't care what anyone thinks about you, people can't use that against you. Yeah, I care there. about myself. That's it. I care what myself thinks about myself. <laughs> Yeah, that reminds me of you, uh, um, uh, Jeremy, where you say your your wife thinks of you as an uh, emotionless robot, right? Because I definitely get that a lot too. She's like, what, "It's like, what are you like, some kind of machine? Like, you just don't care what people think of you." And I'm like, "Well, if if you're if you're secure in the things that you believe in, and you really believe them to be true, and you abide by those things, then you yeah, you shouldn't care about what other people think about exactly, you." Exactly. Yeah, Jeremy. Right? Yeah, well, that I mean, that that comes from the upbringing, though. That comes from the the conformity that everybody's used to. They they look at people like us, like we're we're outcasts and and we're we're weird and and we're always causing trouble just because we we think differently than than other people do. Um, you know, I, I didn't always think this way. I I used you know years ago I would have looked at the, the the situation like with the Nogglers and been like, oh, that's a shame. Um, they probably should have been uh, following the rules a little better, you know. And that's the mentality of a lot of people, and and they think, you know, we're just we're just we're just being different just to be different. It's like, well, to a certain extent, that's true because we've seen what the what the conformist side looks like, and it's not pretty <laughs> when you step back. So we want to we we are we are different because it's it's the only way things are going to change if if everybody keeps conforming and and keeps get going along to get along while well, the status quo is going to be here forever and it, you know when you when you really examine it, it that that's pretty scary because the the status quo is is not all uh you know not all wine and roses like most people think it is it's it's there's a there's an ugly truth there that you know people that just want to live people that just want to raise their children to understand what it is to live rather than what it is to conform are looked at as a threat. You know, that that's really what it comes down to. People like the Nogglers, people like us, you know, we're a threat to society. You know, I mean, I mean the, the, the DHS has labeled people like us terrorists, but just to the average citizen, even without that labeling, we're a threat to the status quo. We see the world differently because we took a step back and and started to you know learn how to use logic and, and look at the situation and say hey wait a minute there's a lot of contradictions going on here what's what, what's up with that and when you step back and see that and then you make the connections and you start 
living your life a certain way. It, it, it really is. It's a threat to everybody else because they, they would have to question everything they know in order to understand you. And that's a very scary proposition for people. So it, it's just much easier to, to call a, an agent of the state to make sure nothing's going wrong um, rather than to um, question your own beliefs. You know, that's actually something you touched on earlier, Skylar, about, you know, the, the, the whole snitches thing and um, how you, you know, to a certain extent, it, you, you would appreciate your neighbors keeping an eye on things. Well, yeah, if they go to you first, if they see something and, and want to say something, if they say it to you, yeah. that's one thing like that, that goes into the whole tribal attitude too. Like if you live in a neighborhood and you, you know, you make friends with your neighbors and everybody kind of keeps an eye on each other. If something goes wrong, they go to you first. That's perfectly fine. Like that's how a voluntary society would work in my mind. People would, you know, you knock on the door and say, Hey, I saw this. Is, is anything, is anything wrong? Is everything okay? Rather than their first instinct to go, you know, literally, you know, I deal with it all the time here on Long Island just with my dog walking business where people you see people like peering out their windows and like you know it's and unfortunately <laughs> I, I i hate to generalize but it's usually the older people you know the the elderly people that that have nothing that are home during the day and have nothing better to do and oh, uh you know i get it from my clients all the time they'll they'll tell me when i first start working for them they'll be like just ignore miss so-and-so or mr so-and-so they're always you know they're nice and they mean well but they're literally just staring at everything because they've got nothing better to do but instead of calling you or walking up to you they'll just call somebody from the state right away like that's their first instinct just i gotta call somebody idle you know? hands is the devil's playground yeah and it's yeah. just <laughs> because they don't see they don't see reality they see what the mainstream news feeds them and they see something something's a little off oh it must be wrong we need to call somebody rather than saying rather than seeing what actually happens you know all too often when you know the, the law enforcement is called in in any number of situations and people end up dead for no reason because they go to the wrong house or they shoot your dog or you know like any of these things happen and it, it happens in cps cases too where these you know just because somebody saw something that they were too cowardly to walk up to the person and ask and they just called an agent of the state instead and then these kids are ripped away and uh you know even if the person did nothing wrong you know it, it's it's hard to get that time back your kids are taken away from you for a month two months six months a year while you're dealing with the stuff like unfortunately what they're dealing with now i mean it, it seems that they have you know the nogglers have a lot of support thankfully but it, it does seem like there is a little vindictiveness going on in the system already and they may you know with the judge already saying well the cps didn't you know they didn't find anything wrong but i'm just going to hold out until we deal with this other stuff like they can find anything to extend that and then the kids are mm -hmm. just kept away even longer and and that's where that's where the, the danger lies because you know there something bad could happen to them while they're away their mind could get poisoned by by people that don't understand the situation and are just ignorant and will tell them, oh, your, your parents are doing these horrible things and, and you should be living in a regular house and you should be going to school. And like you said, with the younger ones, that's the toughest because they're still so impressionable that mm -hmm. on top of missing mommy and daddy, now they're going to have this new person f filling their, their heads with all these things and they're going to walk out even more. Con yeah, and they're going to be even more confused. And again, the sad thing is, is most, I like to think most of those people do have good intentions but because they know nothing but the state they'll just they'll feed these kids the same garbage they were fed and not think twice about it you know they do the, the same thing with their own kids you know they they went most people will say they hated the public school experience but then they'll send their kids to public school <laughs> it's, it's, almost... the it's the fish and water example i, I can just see the the memes now is it's like if you if you don't want your kids confiscated, send them to public school. <laughs> you know? Comply or die. Send them to Comply. prison. Yeah. Uh, so. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I think that a free society. I would hope that a free society is a society filled with vigilantes. Everybody's a vigilante, you know. And when somebody sees something wrong, rather than calling somebody you know, because they have a firearm, you know, so they can protect themselves. And, you know, there's just sort of that culture of gun ownership and that culture of self-defense. If they're, you know, brave enough and 
you know, some people will be braver than others. They'll go confront it themselves or they'll, they'll get some neighbors and then they'll go, they'll go confront it together and they'll just take care of it, whatever it is. They'll figure out what's going on together rather than just calling somebody, and, you know, and then, you know, washing their hands of it. And then that, that person who they call has immunity from accountability when they, when they screw up. That's that, you know, again, that's the problem that we have that we're dealing with now. So yeah, I, I mean, I want people to want vigilance and I want vigilantes. I just, you know, I think everybody should be a vigilante and be allowed to be a vigilante. You know, it's, that's why I like, you know, the Batman's and the green and the sun the wind around and the police are freaked out calling them vigilantes you know people see that and they're like yeah they're vigilantes but they're keeping an eye on they're helping <laughs> i like that you know i want more of that i mean that's why i, can I think so I, carry. I think i think people like that too you know i think that's why that's that's the appeal of a lot of these things and that's why they've endured is because it's people um and in some cases it's just regular people without powers that are standing up and fighting injustice in that's half of the reason why i carry or can still carry it pretty much everywhere I go is, you know, if I see something, I'm going to stop it. You know, if I see someone getting mugged, if I see, if I'm in a Taco Bell and someone, and someone runs in and holds the place up, I'm going to try to stop it. Hey, so, I, had, I had an idea. I'm going to get you guys' thoughts. So concealed carry is probably safe than non-concealed carry. Like you can just carry, but this day and age that attracts a lot of attention, right? People will like call the police if they see. Well, I'm always worried if I open like I'll open carry if I'm around friends or I'm like at someone's house or something. But if I'm out in public, I don't want to. You don't want the attention. I don't want the attention. Number one and number two, I'm always afraid somebody could run up and grab it. Okay. So I mean, I know that's probably an irrational fear, but it could happen. Somebody could just snap one day, see that gun on somebody's holster, walk up behind them, grab it, and start shooting. So, So the idea that I had was. Um, getting some badges made that are that are real badges, and I have one when I work. I used to work security. Um, I have a real badge, you know, it's real metal, and something that you can wear if you are going to carry on the outside. You wear this badge, and on the badge, and, and from a distance, it, it looks like a police badge, right? And I so think people will see there's that. the, the, the we'll look at it. The we, spectrum we for close. impersonating a uh, police officer is really wide. Okay. So it well, might it not be a good it, idea to do that. Right. What it says on it is citizens watch, observe, and deter, or something along those lines. And that way people, the first look, rather than drawing the attention, they'll see you have a gun, but then they'll also see kind of this badge, and they might, I, I, think, it would, I think it would turn a lot of people away, would kind of turn away a lot of the attention that you would otherwise get. Well, you know, plus if you do see something going on, you can approach and say, hey, what's going on? You know, I, I think... I don't know. I, I registered for some um, there's some police forum. I went and registered because <laughs> I wanted to ask them the question. What what would you do if you saw something? Like you know, I wanted to get their opinions from actual cops, but they they haven't given me posting abilities yet because I'm not <laughs> filling out their big questionnaire about who I am and stuff. <laughs> but you can about. always go into Reddit, reddit.com slash r slash police or protect and serve. That's the police subreddit, okay. Protect and Serve, and you could just you could just ask in there. Yeah, I was just, make make, I was make just a throwaway curious. account so they can't pick through everything you've ever posted on Reddit. Yeah, there you go. Well, in, in a civilized society, I, th- I think what you're talking about would be wonderful. Unfortunately, as as Dave touched on right now, because law enforcement has the monopoly on that uh, service, uh, they will. Call call you even even if you're doing it for the right reasons, you'll be considered you know impersonating a police officer, which is wrong. I think it's really um, wide. I, I think the spectrum. I think everything, it's like everything is. It, even it, if you say you're police, like well, they most, can. Yeah. Most 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 laws are purposely vague for that reason, but that's just another one of those double standards where, you know, people are can are are conditioned to be convinced that you know police officers are these heroes no matter what they do because they enforce the law that impersonating a police officer is like a bigger crime than some other things um killing a police officer is you know punishable by more than just killing the average person you know they're put on this pedestal and they're given you know people don't see that if you kill a police and, dog <laughs> well yeah and it's the the, the whole the, the whole reason that equality under the law is complete and utter bullshit 
because you cannot have equality under the law when certain people are, are, are held up to a different standard and are literally a separate class. And the, the, the punishments for doing things to them or even impersonating them are worse than doing the same exact thing to, an, to the average citizen. I'm um, surprised police officers haven't started putting uniforms on squirrels and camping out busy roads. <laughs> Don't give him. You any killed an officer. <laughs> you ran over an officer. Well, see, I, I, I think, I think of that, and I think of that scene in uh, Half Baked with uh, Buttercup. You killed Buttercup. <laughs> it was a big deal because he killed the police horse. But, yeah. Uh, the the one thing you were saying, Skylar, about you know the whole idea with the badge and stuff, and you know, like I said, on, unfortunately, right now that wouldn't work because you'd get hauled off for impersonating a police officer. But the idea in general is great. That you know, that's why I'm a big fan of the even though it hasn't really taken off too much yet, the the Peacekeeper app. Mm. Um, you know, which that's that's the whole idea behind it connecting with your neighbors and your friends close by so when an emergency happens whether it's something that the average person would call the police for or you would call the fire department for or you would call an ambulance for or anything like that instead of waiting for them to show up you call people that are literally next door right down the block and you you know that 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 whole system is designed where you can instantaneously connect with you know all the people on your list and say hey this is going on is any who's around can somebody help and you know when you're talking about your neighborhood even in a small town your neighbors are going to be able to get to you or get to you know your location a hell of a lot quicker than any police fire or ambulance ever could um you know and that's why i i you know i supported that that app when it first came out and you know not that i have a lot of money but i gave some money towards it because i think it's a brilliant idea it's it's a way not only to for people like us to protect ourselves and you know and our families but it also fosters a, a bond you know it fosters the, the whole idea of an actual community not these contrived ones that were forced into through statism where you know you 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 walk on eggshells around your neighbors because you're you know if if you're the average person you're too busy with your you know with whatever's going on in your life and all the wonderful distractions to be bothered um but if you're somebody like us you're worried about what your neighbor might say because you do things a little differently so that that whole the whole idea of community is not really there and and something like that app or something like what you're talking about skylar like that that could help foster that idea where people have more trust in one another again rather than just running off to the police every time they think something is wrong you know you you turn to your neighbor and say hey can i help you out hey, you know I, I i always go back to like the example of what happened during hurricane sandy like you know even all even all the statists around here that are you know so quick to call the police on over everything or call cps or, or call just any state agent rather than actually knocking on somebody's door and talking to themselves in those situations and that's when that's when the average individual finally sees that the the help is not right around the corner like they've been taught their whole lives and you're forced to go out there and talk to your neighbors and offer each other help and that sense of community rises and it's wonderful to see but then as soon as the power comes back on and after a couple of weeks everything goes back to normal and they all forget about it again it's you know it's I didn't forget about it, you know. I, I still thank my neighbor, my neighbor who lives behind me, every time I see him. Because if it wasn't for him, I would have had no power at all for two weeks. You know, he just happened to have power at his house, and I knock. He saw me and said, "Hey, do you want you want some power? You got an extension cord? You know, <laughs> nice. plug your fridge up, huh? It, yeah, yeah the, exactly. Uh, the uh, the notion that uh, that Skyler brought up about the vigilantes. I just wanted to say something that in a in a voluntary society, they wouldn't be called vigilantes. They'd just be called people, right? <laughs> moral, <laughs> moral <shame>. people, <laughs> right? Peacekeepers. Because you call yeah. them vigilantes now because because they're they're um, competing with the law enforcement officers, right? <laughs> but uh, in normal well, society, they're just thing. Um, I don't know if you've read anything on the old American West. You've probably seen. There's a book on. There's a book on it, The Not So Wild Wild West, and there's also an earlier um, Libertarian Journal of Libertarian Studies article on it. But that's something that they talk about is what, what was called vigilance committees, where it would be people basically assigned to keep keep the lookout, and then when there were issues, they would come together, and it was a, it was a decentralized thing. So very interesting. I, I mean, yeah, I'd yeah. like to take this second to, you know, uh, 
advertise my my new business endeavor. Uh, it's called Dave's Arbitration Services. You can only pay me in Bitcoin, and I will promise you a <laughs> fair and impartial trial or any dispute resolution. What was it? Wasn't right. didn't George Carlin say a similar thing? He's like, I believe in Joe Pesci because. He's like, oh, yeah, that was about God. He's like, I don't pray to God. I pray to Joe Pesci because there's about 50% uh, success rate with either one. So <laughs> jo Joe Pesci with a bat can solve most of my problems. <laughs> oh, man, when Joe but, Pesci got killed in the last – all right, man, what movie was that? He got killed and they're like – was it the one where they go out to the cornfield? Oh, uh, no, no, no. That's, that's Casino. Casino, casino. Yeah, casino. yeah, yeah. And, casino. Was, and he looks at him like, oh. It's me that's getting whacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but um, but yeah. I mean, that that that's the thing that we that we that we are opposing is the double standards that that some people can do things with complete sovereign immunity, right? That we, as average regular people, cannot do. You know, it's like it's like Jeremy, you said, is, is if you kill a cop, it's not like killing a regular person, right? <laughs> and and what comes to mind actually is like is like nine eleven because. It's like it's not only that they just killed three thousand people, and you know that that kind of people kind of forgot that because now how many people died in the Middle East as a result? <laughs> like what, close to a million people died in the Middle East. I so think it, more it, soldiers have died than. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like if you kill a cop and then they kill your family, your extended family, your, <laughs> you know, your third cousins, you know, you know, because because you killed you killed a is a government agent right and they're not they're not a regular person they don't have you know they're not subject to morality they're not subject to the golden rule right they're subject to something else right they have special superhuman powers that are granted to them by a magical piece of paper we call the constitution right <laughs> and and um and people don't see that, you know, or maybe they do see that contradiction, but they just ignore it and they say, you know what? Well, we we need this institution because, again, if, if nobody if nobody's out there, uh, you know, um, harassing people and uh, pulling them over for you know burnt out tail lights or uh, <laughs> or or, uh, or uh, tinted windows, there's gonna be lawlessness. <laughs> you know, it's oh, just yeah. gonna be it's gonna be anarchy. But uh, I, I I love that video. The, the 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 cop pulls over another cop, but he doesn't realize it's a cop. And the guy gets out of the car and he's like, what the hell are you doing? Why'd you pull me over? And he's like, put your fucking hands up on the car. And he's like, I'm not doing that shit. And they get in like a real fight, go to the ground and start punching each other. And like three other cops jump up on him, pull him apart. And he's like, I'm a fucking cop, you asshole. And they're like, oh, well, all right, have a good day. And they turn around and walk away. And it's like, if that was, if that, like, that's just bullshit. Like, whoever threw the first punch should go to jail. Like. Well, it it just didn't happen, right? <laughs> oh no, he's special. He's a special human being. Yeah. You know what? What did I say on the podcast last night when we were recording "Force to Freedom"? How much crime would there be in the in the country if Barack Obama went out uh, tomorrow in a press conference and deputized the entire nation into the sheriff's department? <laughs> like, what what would happen? Like, what what what, what would the crime be? <laughs> And that reminds me of a, of a recent uh, Tom Woods uh, podcast I was listening to. He's basically saying, you know, if you go to business school and you excelled, like you got really high grades, you paid attention, you learned a lot, and, you know, that person uh, most likely would not become a government agent, right? That person most likely would become an entrepreneur and add value to society and produce jobs and, you know, increase wealth. The person who becomes a government agent is the guy who got a D, right? So the guy who got a D will most likely go into a regulating agency to regulate and control the guy who excelled. <laughs> so it's we are controlled and monitored and subjugated by stupid people, basically. The, <laughs> the morally bankrupt and the intellectually bankrupt in our society are the ones that are controlling because they Shit think... Shit attracts flies. <laughs> <laughs> because they think without them, things will go to hell. <laughs> right? So it's a, it's a whole perverted uh, Alice in Wonderland world that we're all living in that everyone thinks is normal and is reality. And like, like you said, Jeremy, like, like during Hurricane Katrina, 
like that everybody thought you know oh no that's the end of the world and then they go back to you know everything comes back oh okay now back to normal cops are superhuman and i'm just a, a joe Schmo. all right back to normal <laughs> go back to work it's a, so it's a, it's a very short-term <laughs> memory people have and that, that's 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 part of what we're up against on a daily basis because even when even when you know even when like the the snowden revelations came out like uh, more people than i thought were up in arms about it but then it quickly went away because the next news cycle comes out and people <laughs> forget and they just they move on and and it's it's not that important anymore and it because well things were bad for a little while but they'll get better and and we still need this system and you know it, 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 as always it goes back to the appeal, appeal to antiquity where it's just well this is the way it's been and you know, we may be able to tweak it, but we're not going to get much better than this. So why bother trying? And I don't I'm know. I'm weird. I want an NSA agent to read every word I'm typing. Well, I want I him to. I don't. I want him to read everything I'm typing. That, that, that's that's one of the few times that I have no problem saying I have nothing to hide. Go right ahead and look. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not maybe, a. Maybe, I have nothing to hide. You, no, no, no. I'm saying I'm saying maybe you'll learn something. That's why. Yeah, I, that's what I want him to. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not quiet about spread the like seeds that. to the NSA agents. I think I think Larkin Rose talked about that. Like he was saying, imagine like being the NSA people reading voluntarist messages and emails, and then and then they're basically indoctrinated by their superiors. You know, do not research this stuff just <laughs> these people are bad <laughs> don't look into this further okay this is terrorism yeah. at its finest <laughs> i need you to read it like this like uh, they're just trying like, to like, like, you. like read it just the middle of it like like peek through your eye and then like just, wipe it out of your brain right after you read it just flag certain words don't read just you <laughs> see a word just flag it that's it that's your job so and what's the next one though <laughs> so um so yeah i, I think we should just uh, give our our final comments on um on this subject on you know cps and you know uh, our benevolent uh, monopoly on violence <laughs> so skylar will, will, you have any last words you'd give to people uh, who think that the cps is an agency that we absolutely need for a civilized society <laughs> um well i i would say look into um there's a, a guy by the name of Carlos Morales who is a CPS whistleblower and he wrote a book called Legally Kidnapped where he documents all sorts of horror stories and and the fact is your, your kids are not safe with CPS anywhere in the world and so I, I think that's reason enough. I mean, yeah, I think people should watch out for each other but I don't think that that means that we should give an unaccountable agency the power that, that they have right now to do that. Which is essentially a for-profit agency because they have to keep pushing their budget higher and higher. So they're going to find anything they can to take your kids to justify, for profit. Yeah. yeah, to justify <laughs> themselves. Well, they're for-profit like a tick is for blood. <laughs> they're not really. Right. They're not really like they don't need profit. Like they could literally go in there and never do their job, never take one kid out of their house, and they would still exist. So. They're not really for profit, but they get these bigger budgets. They can hire more people, get better pay grades, better raises. I guess have a better sense of justification for their job. I mean, I have such disdain for government workers that I really don't feel comfortable saying pretty much everything I feel about it on camera or voice. But I'm just I'm not a big fan of anybody who prides their their work and is also a welfare recipient. And if you collect the government check, you are a welfare recipient. That's not if something you, you should be pride. You should carry pride in your heart about. Yeah, according to Carlos Morales, they have quotas, and so they've got to go out. And they've got find you know problems, you know, and if they're not finding problems, they've got to they've got to you know look a little harder or expand the definition of problem. Oh, it's yeah, it's like the cop that was on TV the other day goes, "Yeah, I don't have any quotas, but uh, if I don't write enough tickets, uh, I'm not gonna have a job." <laughs> it's like okay uh you're dumb as fuck i'm glad you have a gun and you have basically immunity yeah all right yeah so any, any last words jeremy for the uh the status stasius out there <laughs> statiests um well uh, skylar touched on that book that i i was i was going to mention that too the, the carlos morales book is a really good one um you know i i, I would just say it's pretty much the same thing, you know, instead of 
running to the agents of the state if you think there's something wrong ask somebody first <laughs> you know don't quickly just run off and or, or assume something's wrong because it seems different to you you know the the people may be doing things differently than what you're used to for a myriad of reasons you know and it, there's there there's enough documentation to show that bad things can and will happen when you call the the agents of government in um, when you yourself don't have all the facts you know it it it, it backfires a lot of the time you know we, we touched on it earlier in the show where you know a lot of these people have good intentions but they don't think because the state's all they've ever known so their first instinct is just call somebody in the state and, and they'll come take care of it and if, if you don't have all the information you're not in a position to be making a judgment like that you know if 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 you want to get a group of the neighbors together and you all go over together and, and ask what's going on that's still better than just picking up a phone before you know what the actual facts are um, you know and I like I said I would just encourage people to try uh, try diversifying your your information a little bit you know the, the colors color heck the Carlos Morales book is a really good one but like I said the documentation is everywhere the stories there are there all the time um, you know kids get taken away for something that just because it was deemed illegal um, by some bureaucrat somewhere at some time um, and then you know the kids end up in a worse situation and even if they're they are lucky enough to escape that unscathed they've still been taken away their from their parents for who have done nothing wrong um, you know and just violating some arbitrary edict is not doing harm to your children necessarily you know if, if you're not abusing them if you're not you know starving them um, <laughs> you know all these other little BS things that people call this the agents of the government for um, are not real crimes so there's no reason to jeopardize somebody's family over that so I, I would just encourage people to uh, be a little more cautious before just making that phone call. Um, you know, do a little research yourself. Go, go out there and, and seek out these stories. You know, you can just do a Google search on pretty much any topic when it comes to CPS, and you'll get a bunch of stories kicked back to you. So, just look look into these things a little more because uh, you know, I mean, hopefully everything will work out for the Nogglers. Um, it's a, it's a very terrible situation they find themselves in just because they're trying to you know live a little differently and you know like like we've heard from from all accounts so far um, there wasn't anything wrong with their children you know their children seem to be quite happy and uh, they're learning valuable life lessons that most people probably even the ones that called the called the <laughs> called the police in in the first place um, will never understand because they've ne they have never bothered to try that so you know, it's just just because somebody's different in that aspect doesn't make them wrong. <laughs> it doesn't make you right. So just just in any in any situation, think before you pick up that phone to call any state agent to take care of anything, because the chances of something bad happening to to another person or even you <laughs> are a lot higher than you think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think um, according to Carlos Morales, the most common uh, reasons that people call CPS are number one is marijuana <laughs> use, <laughs> and number two is uh, homeschooling slash unschooling, um, and I think uh, another one is like uh, leaving your kids outside by themselves for four hours, <laughs> which, is, which is still amazing. I mean, uh, like my, my wife, you know, when she was younger in Romania, she would go off like for hours by herself. You know, it's, it's just amazing. The nanny state, how how oppressive it's becoming, you know. Uh, you know, the whole stranger danger thing that they teach them in, uh, in government schools, you know. Um, you know, distrust people, basically. Distrust everyone and just, you know, again, again, you know, teach them to be snitches, I guess, in a sense, you know. Um, but, but yeah, just, just us homeschooling and unschooling we are already considered extremists or terrorists or threats to the status quo um you know so just that alone forget about you know abuse just that alone they could call cps like anybody can call cps you know and just make your life a living hell and and people have to understand the ramifications of that simple call 
And and like you said, Jeremy, it's like it's like people. This is another thing that that statism does and belief in government does is it estranges people from each other, right? It's no you you no longer have an incentive to befriend your neighbor, you know, or you know, or get to know the people in your community, if you know you can rely on the state for income or for you know um, for housing or for for medicine or whatever, you know, rely, rely on the state for all these things. What's the incentive to get to know your neighbor? There is no incentive, you know. <laughs> so it's encouraging isolation, you know, true isolationism, <laughs> not the kind that we're thinking about, but true stay in your house and just like um, kind of be a hermit, which, which you know, in a sense is it, it's fine, but it, it's like, you know, we, I, I, it, I can speak for myself that I encourage people talk to people, you know, get to know people, get to know your neighbor. They're not as weird as you think most of the time, <laughs> you know? We're, we're all just people trying to make a living, trying to, you know, put food in the table and educate your kids and make sure they have a good, you know, moral upbringing and, make, you know, try to get them to, to make a better world for, for themselves than, than, you know, we grew up in ourselves. So, so, so yeah, that's it. Just, um, just talk to people you know when you when you jump to conclusions about somebody when you assume what do you do you you make an ass out of you and me right so <laughs> you know just uh talk to people simple message well <laughs> thank you very much everyone for uh for the conversation thank you skylar for coming on uh to talk about the inaugural family and cps wonderful conversation so uh this uh this is the seeds of liberty podcast uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Yeah, and, and you can you can support us through Bitcoin, pay, Patreon. I just started that up, oh, and sorry. through yeah. our uh, Amazon Associates link on the website. Right. Sorry, <laughs> missed out. The yeah. So give us value. Give us value. Forget, uh, talking about freedom is not uh, it's not cheap or easy. It's difficult, <laughs> and that's why that's why we choose to do it. Not because it's the easy path, but because it's the right and moral path. Right. <laughs> So awesome. Thank you very much for the conversation. Have a good day, everyone.